There are good reasons to say that the Jagd Terrier is a product of absolutely Germanic nationality. In fact, the complete name of this little but valid breed of hunting dog is Deutsche Jagd Terrier, i.e. German Hunt Terrier. Immediately after the First World War, or more precisely, about 1918, Germany created a new breed using the Fox Terrier as the initial genetic input. Presumably, it was much darker and not adapted to competitions, because at the time, the Fox Terrier was very much in vogue and consequently, its aesthetic aspect was much valued. The Jag Terrier was not initially standardized in its country of origin and because it was born exclusively to work, the aesthetic factor was considered of little importance. With the passing years and following numerous couplings between dogs that by now had the basic inherent characteristics of the breed, consequently transmitted to the offspring, the type was fixed, giving origin to a dog very similar to what we see now, both during hunting and in the show rings. They were also completed by crossings with Welsh Terriers until a few years ago. The Jag Terrier is not well known and its stubborn, nervous nature has made it one of the few terriers that has not been widely accepted as a companion dog, although it is prized by hunters. In some European countries, including Hungary, France and Czechoslovakia, and naturally Germany, the general public has learned to appreciate all the qualities of this breed, without fearing its lively character, but on the contrary, exploiting it to full advantage. The standard for the Jag Terrier was only fixed in 1991. Consequently, we can see how young this breed is, and in fact, it is still possible to see the evolution of the breed. It is principally a hunting dog, as we have already said, even if small-sized. The height at the withers is between 33 to 41 centimeters. Bitches must weigh between seven to eight kilograms, while the dogs must be nine to 10 kilograms. The Jack Terrier must have a compact, very muscular body without any excess skin folds. On the contrary, the skin and coat must be close fitting to the dog. Its hair is wiry and harsh. As far as the size is concerned, it is necessary to remember that there can be some variation, although not too substantial. The dog can also develop in relationship to the type of work it does. If the Jag Terrier were trained only for working in earths, it would naturally be better to have a height at the lower limits of that than the standard, since it could bend its limbs and enter the lair more easily, moving quickly through the tunnels. However, if the dog were to be used above ground, hunting for catching and hunting hare or boar, it would benefit from as big a size as the standard will allow, as longer legs would naturally give the dog greater speed when running and greater dynamic thrust. As for the legs of the Jagged Terrier, one must at once say that they must be perpendicular with no faults, i.e. no pigeon toes or east-west fronts. The straight and correct legs give the Jag Terrier a phenomenal front bone assembly. They are joined to a long slanted shoulders, a sturdy skeleton, not fragile but very strong and accentuated, and front legs with well-closed feet a little bigger than at the back. They also have an excellent grip on the ground. The back is the true motor of our dog. It must be very muscular, with long thighs and a very good angle. The Jag Terrier must never be down in the pastons, that is, when the back legs are stationary and they are under the end point of the back. 
they must be well grounded at the back, forming an angle which gives this hunter terrier a look of extreme readiness. When it hears the least suspicious noise, it will rush fiercely to see what is happening. The back and the upper line must be very straight, and the back line, while completing the fluid movements of the run, will not be too short. The rib cage in a dog with these characteristics and job will be well-rounded, strong, but not too wide. How else could a large dog slip quickly into the very tight artificial earth, 18 centimeters by 20 centimeters, or worse still, into a natural fox earth that is often tighter and more dangerous? This said, the gait of the Jag Terrier is very fluid, with a stride that, thanks also to the characteristics of great push from the powerful back, covers a lot of ground. The puppy's tail is cut within the first few days of life. It must not be too thin or too short, but harmoniously prolong the dorsal line. Remember that nowadays, and in the past, the dog was pulled out of the lairs and burrows by its tail. The tail should always be docked by competent people. In some countries, docking of dogs' ears and tails is illegal. Passing to the neck of our little hunter, we can see that it must not be too long, with no swan ridges. Very powerful with a well-developed and pronounced musculature, well integrated on the trunk with a slightly flared joining. Last but not least, the head, operational centre of the extremely complicated mental mechanisms that regulate the life of our Jag Terrier. The skull, wide and flat in the middle of the ears, has V-shaped folds on the front and is not too small. The stop, i.e. a slight depression between the cranium and the nasal canal, which like in all hunting breeds and in the pointer is exploited to the maximum, is not very pronounced and the nasal canal is slightly shorter than the muzzle. The nose must always be black in the black dogs and brown in those with the brown coats, but always well pigmented and without markings. The eyes are oval, dark and mobile. They must be the true and honest mirror to the mind of our dog. They are very mobile, lively and frank with an aggressive and vivacious expression that is characteristic of this breed. Like all other hunting dogs, it is very important that the teeth must be correct i.e. they must close to a scissor bite. A separate paragraph is needed to talk about the coat of the jagged terrier. There are two separate types of hair, smooth or rough, although the second type certainly conforms more to the standard, as well as being preferred by breeders and hunters. In fact, a dog that undertakes hard physical work must have a close coat that protects its skin from injuries and abrasions. The coat can be stripped, an operation of removing the excess dead hair by using a special knife, a painless operation for the dog, which if done correctly, allows the new coat to develop better. The hair must be tight, wiry and harsh, but not too long. The jagged terrier must not resemble a walking bush. It must have a healthy appearance and be very glossy, condition that depends on the animal's diet. Black with tan markings is the preferred colour. Small white marks on the chest or on the legs are not sought but are tolerated. This breed was selected by man for hunting, not intended as an activity done in the second person, like a setter for example which only points, but in the first person, flushing out foxes, badgers and even porcupines in countries where this is permitted from their earths. They have a style entirely distinct from that of the Dachshunds, another dog breed used for the hunting in earths. 
The Jag Terrier is a dog that if correctly raised and trained by serious breeders that try to select a certain balanced character is extremely docile with its owner and with its family. A nearly perfect guard dog which will defend you at the cost of its own life. It is extremely patient with children of the house because thanks to its sensitivity and intelligence it realizes their weakness and tends to protect them. With strangers, however, it is much more diffident. This diffidence does not show itself by retreating. This is a dog that does not know how to be afraid. It attacks when it is challenged or negatively stimulated. Thanks to its strong teeth and to the robust vice created by the jaws, it is difficult for the jagged terrier to give up its prey. It is an extremely dominant breed, made up of dogs that do not know, in the real sense of the word, either pain or fear. Consequently, they are not raised with blows or with groundless severity, but laughed and corrected with a real velvet glove. Only like this will they become dogs who love and obey their master, not with gritted teeth, but out of trust. The best advice, above all for those who are new to this breed, is to ask for a list of serious and trustworthy breeders from the Society of Jagged Terriers. Once the breeder has been selected, we must turn to the last difficult decision to make, dog or bitch. In our opinion, it is an irrelevant question, the importance of which is dictated by the needs of the individual. The dog has a more independent character and it is a little harder to understand and dominate, while the bitch, more docile and agreeable, has however the fault, if it can be called such, of going on heat for two weeks about every six months. During this time, for obvious reasons, it cannot be used either for hunting or in competition. As far as hunting is concerned, in our judgment, there are no differences between the two sexes, and if helped correctly to develop their natural talents, nearly all Jag Terriers can become an optimal help in hunting. If instead we want to keep our dog only for company, our choice will be dictated by other reasons. Bear in mind that both the sexes need our time, affection, and the opportunity to discharge all their natural energy, both simulated hunting competitions and long walks in the country. Cure them immediately of the habit of taking possession of the couches, beds, and of the easy chairs. No begging during the master's meal times, no unnecessary damage to the household objects, bearing in mind that it is completely normal in puppies within certain limits to chew the master's belongings. This is an atavistic instinct of dominance and a need to try out teeth from day to day, which are changing in the pup. All this must be done without excessive severity, but with nerves of steel and also with continuous signs of affection from the owner, that in doing so gets more affection from his helper. In spite of the lively open as well as brave character of the Jag Terrier, Probably the first day the puppy will be afraid and feel the lack of its mother, brother and sisters. Place the dog's basket in a calm angle of the house and if it cries during the night, put an old alarm clock wrapped in a duster in its basket. Watch out as it will chew everything in sight. Hearing the noise of the mother's simulated heartbeat will calm the frightened puppy. If we want to keep the dog in the open, a well-insulated basket with some blankets, which will surely end up in shreds, will be enough. In Eastern Europe, this dog has a thickly woven coat, as it is accustomed to being in temperatures a great deal more rigid. It is therefore enough to check if the dog seems uncomfortable, with tremors or with other visible signs, to be sure of its adaption to its new environment. All punishments should be only vocal or light, certainly not any blows or severe punishments, because it is only a puppy and because the Jag Terrier would not understand teaching linked with punishment, because the physical pain often charges it with adrenaline rather than correcting it. If it must live or come into contact with other animals, teach it to respect them without expecting it to socialize too much. 
you must be inflexible in this because if the puppy feels the least relaxation on your part before the end of the training, it could make some serious rash gestures towards an unfortunate victim. In the case of a puppy living with us, we must take care over what comes into contact with its sharp teeth, which could be damaged or, as in the case of an electric wire, damage the dog. The Jag Terrier is not calm or able to go to sleep for hours and hours stretched out in the sun. Therefore, we must provide a good piece of land where it can run about. Also bear in mind that you have in front of you a dog that is capable of jumping without any run-up more than one meter. Raise the fence sufficiently in answer to this gymnastic ability of our friend. Take the necessary steps to supply the puppy with lots of toys of hard leather or rubber so that it can play, learn to bite and not get bored. Do this if you do not want to find rather a lot of objects in the house destroyed. The Jag Terrier does not know how to stand still or rest. Therefore, if you do not take the necessary steps to provide it with pastimes, above all a puppy which still has to learn correct behaviour, it will find it for itself and perhaps they will not be the games we had in mind. If you have children, teach them not to be spiteful to the dog, but on the contrary, encourage them to treat it with familiarity and respect. If they are taught well, you will see the optimum relationship they can have with the Jag Terrier, which will change not into a toy, but into a faithful dog sitter, inflexible guardian of the children. From the point of view of health, they are strong dogs, a robust constitution that does not require a lot of care or treatments to keep them in good health. A normal hygiene routine, a clean kennel, periodic treatment, parasites and deworming, regular vaccinations from weaning and anti-rabies at six to seven months, and the care that an owner must give any dog. Learn to read between the lines of both the physical and mental state of your Jag Terrier from a puppy trying to notice the moments when, with a reassuring word, it is possible to calm it down if it is too heated or encourage it in a difficult situation. If you try to have this understanding and intuition with your dog from its earliest years, you can be sure that it will be easy for you to understand the dog and for it to understand you when it is an adult, with major benefits for both. The first thing that the Jag Terrier must learn, after the basic rules of good cohabitation, of which we have already spoken, is the behaviour on a lead. Even though there are breeders that show very obedient dogs that can walk to heel without the leash, we advise you absolutely not to try this experiment. Above all, do not try in the presence of strangers or other animals or when abroad. It will be more prudent to keep the Jag Terrier on a lead at least until we are absolutely sure of the mental mechanisms of our dog and of its reactions. This above all with young dogs where their characters are still not entirely formed since they would be able to hurt themselves or someone else, voluntary or unintentionally, like often happens in a real accident, nothing would stop a Jag Terrier without a leash from suddenly crossing the road to try to capture a pigeon on the other side, even if there are cars and lorries passing. When the pup is about two months, get it used to wearing a light small chain or leather collar round its neck. Watch out that it does not make an attempt to tear it from its neck and rip it to pieces, perhaps doing itself harm. As the collar is uncomfortable for it, this reaction is very probable. When we see that it is resigned to wearing its collar, attach a very thin leash to the collar and start to play together with the dog. If it has not yet eaten, it will be hungry, so take a favorite snack and grasping the leash, pull it towards you, encouraging the dog and showing it the reward. Step by step, always armed with patience, you will see that the Jag Terrier will learn to follow you more or less docilely on the lead. Do not commit the error of forcing it to complete these first exercises. It will get to hate them and you will find yourself opposite a very stubborn and not very collaborative student. When the Jag Terrier is accustomed to obeying you and to walking on a lead, it will always be towards four or six months old. If you wish it to become a habitué of the work trials, begin to train it.
For fox hunting and boar hunting, steps have been taken to create alternative trials which are not blood sports, but during which the Jag Terrier can show its hunting value. The trial on boar is carried out within a marked zone or an entirely fenced wood. Boars are introduced within the confines, usually sows, so the dog is in no danger of being torn by the terrible tusks of the males. The fenced wood guarantees a meeting between the well-trained dog that covers the entire area and the game. For protection of the animal and of the foxes, competition test earths have been created, so there is no physical contact between the dog and the game. They are very simple tests, but amusing where hunting in earths is simulated. The structure of an artificial earth is composed of large wooden crates, forming a long tunnel from one to two meters in length. It is assembled in accordance to an exact plan. The route is not less than 15 meters or more than 20. These crates, in fact, are made from two wooden planks with a wooden cover which can be removed so the dog can be extracted quickly any time. The base of the large cases is in the beaten ground and they are nearly filled to the top to make the outside of the burrow look even more realistic. This last long run of ground is nearly like that found in the natural earth of a fox. Wells are added to the large cases, circular open spaces that simulate the inner rooms where the fox usually shelters. The game runs inside the burrow for all its length and leaves from the opposite end. It is then put inside a strong iron cage where it is only visible but cannot be reached by the dogs in the competition. Every dog entered in the competition must in turn enter the earth without hesitation, run through the whole length and out into the open, racing toward the cage where the game is confined. At this stage, it must bark at the quarry, showing the right amount of determination and aggressiveness, both fundamental characteristics of this breed. From the second half of the 18th century, fox hunting became very popular and the high society had more land. Thanks to colonial expansion, the quality of life in Britain improved. There was grain for everyone, the farmers raised more chickens and rabbits, and eggs became normal food for all the classes. This also caused an increase in the number of foxes and other raiders who found it easier to take animals from the courtyard or eggs from the hen house than to hunt. The intense hunting that was done by the noble classes of great games such as stags, fallow deer, roe deer, boars had made them extremely rare. So the nobles fell back on a type of hunting activity that they called sport, conforming with the reality in Great Britain and fox hunting was born. Since early times in Britain, there were small dogs on farms specialized in the destruction of pests and able to catch a fox in its earth. These dogs were present in large numbers and varieties, and until 1700, they were raised nearly exclusively for the people, by the people. They used them mainly to catch vermin, above all, rats, that often infested houses and farms, but even the small pests that threaten the courtyard animals and the bigger animals such as foxes and badgers. Then, as we said, the upper classes began to take an interest in these dogs and started to organize fox hunts with precise rules and real ethics of behavior. It is in this social context that in 1795 in Dartmouth, at the mouth of the River Dart in Devonshire, John Russell, 1795-1883, was born. 
Russell studied in Oxford where he graduated and then he became a vicar in the Church of England. Alongside the religious fervor that led him to the church, he always cultivated a passion for hunting, especially foxes, and he searched all his life to find the right dogs for this purpose. Like the majority of people who raised dogs until the first decades of the 20th century, Reverend Russell did not care about the look of the dog. What was interesting in those days was the ability to develop the work to which the animals were destined. Russell very probably began using the old fox terrier and by crossing and crossing he got dogs that very quickly became famous in Great Britain for their hunting ability. John Russell was a man with a personality that was defined flaming and he certainly was not satisfied with a mediocre result but wanted to transmit his human energy to the dogs that he produced. With selection, Russell perfected the terrier with long legs, adapting it to follow the game, accompanying the riders, and then to stop it, or pursue it into the earths if they had burrows. The standard of the Parson Jack Russell Terrier was sketched out in 1904 by Arthur Heinemann. In 1914, the club of the breed was founded, and the dog was recognized by the Kennel Club on January the 22nd of 1990, and of the FCI on July the 2nd of the same year. At the same time, Russell also selected a smaller terrier, longer than it was taller and capable of going into the dens of any harmful animals to attack them. Usually, these little terriers were carried on horseback until the riders reached the fox's earth. The dog was then freed and entered the earth, attacking the animal or forcing it to flee again. This small but very agile and powerful terrier was also a formidable rat catcher and it earned the respect of country people with its ability. The terriers raised by Reverend John Russell, thanks to the fame they deserved, took their name from him. Smaller terriers were also born in the litters produced by Russell, which were commonly called Jack Russell Terriers. They had shorter legs and a stumpier and lengthened body. In 1873, his passion for dogs and for hunting led Reverend Jack Russell, together with other illustrious dog lovers, to establish the English Kennel Club. Russell's extraordinary competence with the Terrier led him in 1874 to judge them in the first official show in London, organised by the Kennel Club. Used nearly exclusively as hunters of vermin, the Jack Russell Terrier has reached us, preserving the physical and psychological characteristics that have brought it much fame in its own country. The breed is widespread and even appears in Ireland and Australia. In 2001, the Russell Jack Terrier was officially accepted by the FCI and included among the breeds of the third group, second section, among the terriers with short legs. The standard is presented as having English origins, but it was developed in Australia, bringing recognition to this country that took care both of the development and the evolution and diffusion. The Jack Russell is an exceptional dog. In fact, in spite of being relatively unknown, it has continued to grow in favor with the public. The intelligence of these dogs is amazing. So much so that they have taken part in numerous advertisements and films. Who can forget the small, pesky, but intelligent little co-star of The Mask? The energy and the joy of these dogs is contagious and it is difficult to remain in a bad mood in their company. Following the fate of the other dogs belonging to the third group, the Jack Russell Terrier is becoming more of a companion dog. 
However, its strong instinct to hunt should not be underestimated. It should not be left to run free in areas where hunting is not permitted. It can disappear as quick as lightning in the pursuit of some prey that its fine-tuned senses have detected. And it is not easy to imagine the speed that the diminutive Jack Russell is capable of. As a companion, it is splendid. It is very involved in the life of the family, whether of one or ten people. It is lively, amusing and funny, and always ready to share its mood with the people it loves. If you are happy, it too will be happy. If you are sad, it will share your sadness, but will look in every way to amuse you and cheer you up. With members of the family, it is kind and affectionate, but as often happens with dogs, it will choose its master to whom it will grant absolute devotion. If something happens that the dog feels is a fault, get ready for a little spite with which it will communicate its disappointment to you. This is done with overwhelming sympathy, which is the fundamental characteristic of the Jack Russell. With children, it is playful and tolerant. It will be necessary to teach them to respect the dog. The Jack Russell possesses a strong temperament and it will not put up with being treated like a toy very easily. It is better, therefore, to watch out that the children are not spiteful and do not play jokes on the dog because sooner or later, your Jack Russell will get even. Although it seems unbelievable, the Jack Russell Terrier requires a strong man who knows what to do. Do not be deceived by its size. It is a hot terrier capable of attacking any adversary without considering the size and always ready to answer to the provocations of other dogs. It is constantly necessary to take care that little skirmishes do not become real brawls. Do not forget that having a Jack Russell Terrier is like having a little car with a Formula One engine. The amazing intelligence and the high level of energy of this dog could tire anyone who is not prepared. It is advisable then, before adopting it, to ask someone who already has won some questions. Those who have one of these little rascals for a companion say they would never change it for any other dog. This is because, in spite of its difficult character, the Jack Russell Terrier is one of the small dogs capable of capturing the heart of those who love it. FCI Classification Group 3 Terrier Section 2 Short Leg Terrier with Work Trial General Aspect Working Terrier, strong, active, agile, of great character with a flexible body of average length. Its movement accompanies its vivacious expression. The docking of the tail is optional and the hair can be smooth, hard, without protection, broken, or rough with protection, rough. Important proportions. Altogether, the dog is longer than it is tall. The height of the body measured at the withers to the sternum must be equal to the length of the front leg from the elbow to the ground. The circumference of the thorax to the level of the elbows must measure about 40 to 43 centimeters. Temperament. It is a terrier full of life, energetic, with a lively and intelligent expression, determined and fierce, friendly but discreetly reserved. Head. The skull must be flat and slightly wide. It narrows gradually towards the eyes and gets thinner towards a full muzzle. There is a clear stop but not very pronounced. The nose is black. The distance from the stop to the tip of the nose must be slightly shorter in comparison than that from the stop to the occiput. Close-fitted black lips. Well-developed masseta muscles. Jaws and teeth very powerful, sunken face wide and strong. Strong teeth which close to a scissor bite. Little almond-shaped dark eyes with a lively expression. They must not be bulging and the eyelids must be close-fitting. 
Its palpable arches must be black. Ears are folded up in front with a good consistency and very mobile. Neck strong and lean, joined to the head, which must be carried with boldness. Body rectangular, general aspect. Rump is level to the upper line. The length from the withers to the joining of the tail is slightly more than the height from the withers to the ground. The loins must be low-waisted, strong and very muscular. It must have a thorax nearly as deep as it is wide and a good distance from the ground which allows the sternum to join halfway between the withers and the ground. The ribs go out from the backbone and flatten on the sides in a way that the circumference of the ribs after the elbows can be measured with the span of two hands joined together, about 40 to 43 centimetres. The top of the sternum shows in front of the shoulder blades. Tail, it may be lowered at rest. When in action, it must be erect, and if it is docked, it must be long enough for it to reach the height of the ears. Limbs, front legs with shoulders slanting well backwards and not weighted with evident musculature. Legs with straight bones from the top of the elbow to the foot. The arms are long enough and angled enough to assure that the elbows are placed under the trunk. Strong back and muscular limbs, balanced in proportion like the shoulders, well-angled knees, metatarsuses parallel if seen from in front, and at rest, short hocks, strong round feet with thick but not wide plantar pads, moderately curved toes that neither rotate in or out, walk and movement, definite, loose and springy. Coat. The hair can be smooth or hard, with or without protection. It must be impermeable. The coat must not be stripped to look smooth or hard. The white colour must predominate on black, tan or brown markings. Size and weight. Its ideal height is 25 to 30 centimetres. 10 to 12 inches, equivalent weight of 1 kilo every 5 centimetres of height. For example, a dog of 25 centimetres must weigh about 5 kilos, one of 30 centimetres about 6 kilos. A proper diet is essential to your dog's correct and full development so as to be able to keep it in perfect shape and health. Some people believe that dogs can eat virtually anything and therefore give their dogs all kinds of food, often recycling the leftovers from their own meals. This is a serious mistake since what may be digestible to us and a source of nourishing substances often cannot be digested by dogs or is unable to be metabolized. A final piece of advice. It sometimes happens that a dog loses its appetite and refuses food for one or even two days. This is a normal occurrence, and in these cases it is a good rule not to always leave a full bowl of food down for the dogs. Instead, the food should be removed after a short time. Present the bowl of food again at the following mealtime after having changed its contents. In the event of loss of appetite lasting for more than two days without the presence of side symptoms, or if it is accompanied from the outset by symptoms of general suffering or exhaustion, consult your vet immediately. It is very likely to be an ordinary ailment, but in this case it is not worth taking a risk, and it is better to seek reassurance from an expert. We will now begin with a brief description of a dog's digestive apparatus. As in all carnivores, the stomach is of large dimensions, whereas the intestine is relatively short. Initial digestion in the stomach takes from three to eight hours. Then the food passes into the intestine, where the nourishing substances are assimilated, which are then transmitted to all the organs through the blood. The stomach's large capacity and the slow digestion process allow abundant meals to be eaten at fairly spaced out intervals. Naturally, to keep dogs in excellent health, it is necessary to provide them with all the elements that they require, that is, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins and minerals. When dogs were carnivorous predators, these elements were assimilated by dogs through the animals that they hunted and which were generally herbivores. Afterwards, civilization has led it to feed differently, but it will always be necessary to provide dogs with the appropriate substances. Dogs produce energy from their diet, which is then used for the maintenance of vital functions and movement. The more active a dog is, the greater the energy intake it will require. 
Without going into detailed food studies that would require a specific treatise, we can simply say that dogs particularly require fats or lipids, both of animal and vegetable origin, and it is these which provide the necessary energy and which accumulate in the organism to provide possible energy reserves. The proteins that make up the large part of the animal's body are also essential. These are indispensable to the formation of all the tissues, especially muscles, and also constitute the basis of hormones and the blood. They therefore represent an irreplaceable element in a proper diet, even more so in puppies which must build their bodies. Sources of protein are meat, cheese, eggs and fish which are well digested by dogs and also soya bean flour, peanuts, legumes which are however digested with more difficulty. An excess of proteins is harmful and can lead to various kinds of disorders depending on the conditions. Carbohydrates are not essential to a dog's diet. They are however very useful at the end of pregnancy. Starch which is the most important carbohydrate present in the diet, is poorly digested by dogs and needs to undergo preliminary treatment such as cooking, flaking, etc. This is why if you use pasta or rice as a food for your canine friend, it needs to be boiled for a long time to eliminate a large part of the starch present. Fibre, which often accompanies carbohydrates, is especially useful in the diet of sedentary dogs since it helps to prevent constipation, given the speed with which it passes through the alimentary tract. Vitamins are also necessary, even if in infinitesimal amounts. They are found in many vegetables and are synthesized by herbivorous animals. This is the reason why when a carnivore kills its prey, generally herbivorous, it immediately feeds on the intestines, where there are residues of partially digested vegetable matter. This also explains why, to your considerable annoyance, your dog often eats the excrement of herbivorous animals as soon as it gets the chance. A build-up of vitamins can be harmful and therefore, if you use pre-prepared feed, you should carefully check the substances contained in the feed before adding supplements and, if in doubt, consult your vet. Minerals are essential to the diet and are supplied by foods. Deficiency in certain minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, sodium, copper and others can cause abnormal growth in puppies also with serious consequences and general debility in adult dogs or the onset of problems of varying degrees. There is excellent pre-packed feed on the market, both moist and dry types, that provide all the necessary elements for initial growth and to then keep your dog in top shape. Even if you use pre-packed feed, you will however be able to give some fruit or other food which your dog will find tasty taking care not to exaggerate and not to give harmful substances such as sweets, fried foods, rice dishes, fresh or soft doughy bread that are extremely harmful and which can also have very serious long-term consequences. Instead, if you want to prepare the food yourself, then follow the advice of the breeder who sold you the dog or your vet's advice. As a general rule, it is worth knowing that meat, ideally beef, is essential. If pork meat is given, it must be well cooked in order to avoid infections. Poultry, meat and rabbit are also fine, provided that they are completely boneless. Giblets, although less rich in nourishing substances, are well liked. Fish is an excellent food and is best given cooked. It is particularly advisable for low-fat diets for dogs with digestive or skin problems. It is also an excellent means with which to make the diet less monotonous. Eggs are appetizing and supply many nourishing substances. They are particularly advisable for puppies and suckling females. Yolks can be consumed raw, whereas the albumin should always be cooked. Fats, such as lard and oil, are always readily accepted by dogs and are particularly useful during moments of work or physical effort. One or two teaspoonfuls of oil added to food are always beneficial. Dry bread is a good energy source, but it must be well dried. It is also useful for cleaning your dog's teeth and for keeping them in good condition. Pasta and rice are very useful, but as we have already said, they should be cooked very well to eliminate starch, which is not easily digested. Fruit and vegetables, even if not essential, can be given to dogs that appreciate them. 
However, the nutritional intake is very slight and is only worthy of note for the intake of roughage. Needless to say, the final element which is essential to nutrition is water. Fresh and plentiful, that must be available at all times. If in a bowl, it should be changed as often as possible, especially during hot spells. It is absolutely indispensable to dogs that eat dry and not moistened feed. The final aspect of the diet to take into consideration is the frequency of meals. From birth, puppies have their meals by following times that are spaced out by the instinct of the mother and the other siblings in the litter. The feeds are gradually reduced during weaning and are integrated with suitable foods that should be recommended by an experienced breeder or a vet. Between one and three months of age, weaned puppies should have four meals at regular intervals. From four to seven or eight months, the number of meals can be reduced to three, further reduced to two meals at eight to 18 months, and afterwards, if desired, down to just one meal a day, even if it is not harmful to continue with two. On the contrary, this is recommended by certain individuals. The decision to have a dog is an important one to make, which must be thought over carefully without ignoring some useful basic information. The vaccination prophylaxis must always be carried out with utmost care to try and protect not only the puppies but also adult dogs from the most common illnesses. Generally speaking, a puppy leaves the breeder after having been vaccinated at around 40 to 45 days with a triad vaccine against canine distemper, infectious hepatitis and parvovirus. A second quadrivalent vaccination, also including leptospirosis as well as the three ailments already mentioned, is generally carried out after three weeks. An additional vaccination can be carried out after a month, again quadrivalent, to be then replaced annually throughout the dog's lifespan. A dog can be vaccinated only if it is in perfect health and thus also free from endoparasites. Appropriate anti-helminthic treatment must be carried out normally twice a year. Different types of ascarids exist, each of which specifically infests an animal species, man included, and there is practically no risk of zoonosis, that is, transmission of the infestation from dog to man. It is important that dogs are also kept free from ectoparasites, that is, those that live on dogs such as fleas and mites, both of which are hematophages. Moreover, fleas act as an intermediate host for a type of taenia. Numerous specific products exist to free dogs from these annoying parasites, but one must not forget to also carry out appropriate disinfesting operations in the areas where dogs live. The arrival of spring exacerbates the problems caused by undesired guests, the mites that arrive along with the initial spring warmth. A run in the meadows through woods, perhaps near groups of farmhouses and farms where there is livestock, can result in our canine friend returning home with mites, not necessarily since some factors may exist which make a dog more or less susceptible, also depending on its general state of health that can influence whether or not a dog will pick up these akari. They represent a grave danger to dogs because they transmit pyroplasmosis, a serious infection carried by protozoa of the pyroplasma species that affects pets and also causes death if not discovered and treated in time. The symptoms in its acute form are represented by fever, also sthenic, asthenia, pallor of the apparent mucous membranes and hypochromia of the urine that can also become brown-black in colour. In advanced cases, jaundice and a comatose state which could possibly result in death. The mites suck blood for two or three weeks and once having mated, the female then detaches itself from the animal and deposits the eggs a week later. The deposited larvae, recognisable by their reddish colour, are minute, like tiny beads. They also look for a host on which to climb, sucking blood for several days. They then detach themselves and after a few days change into octopede nymphs of bluish colour. They become adults towards August or September. With the arrival of autumn, the adults immediately upon hatching then lay dormant in cracks in the ground until the next spring. In general, the mites attach themselves to less thick skin such as ears, armpits, groin, between the digits of the paws. 
Therefore, as a precautionary measure, we should always examine our canine friends for signs of any undesired guests after a walk in the open. Correct dog hygiene starts with coat care. For most breeds, but not all, it is advisable to brush the coat almost daily in order to remove the hairs that have reached the end of their life cycle. The coat of many breeds requires specialised grooming which is to be carried out several times a year. One must not generalise about the fact that a shiny coat is a sign of good health, since in some breeds it should have a tendency to be dull. Dogs must not be washed too often so as not to damage the protective function of the sebaceous glands. The skin in normal conditions should always look clean without dandruff deposits or desquamations of any kind. Should cutaneous alterations appear, such as eczema, alopecic areas, i.e. hair loss and failure of hair regrowth, thickening or the appearance of abnormal pigmentation, consult your vet without delay. Cutaneous alterations due to mycosis or mange are spread by contagion, but only in the case of particularly debilitated animals and when one fails to observe the most basic hygienic rules. Claws must also be checked periodically. These are normally worn down in dogs that undergo normal physical activities, but it may be necessary to shorten them with the aid of a special tool. Oral hygiene should never be overlooked, and especially in miniature breeds, tartar removal is necessary from time to time because it can cause pyorrhea and bad breath. Certain bones are available on the market that besides constituting a treat for our four-legged friend, act as a natural toothbrush. In puppies aged between four and six months, the deciduous dentition is gradually replaced by the permanent one. Regular inspections of the mouth are advisable during this period to check that everything is okay. The existence of cardiopulmonary filariasis, a serious disease caused by a nematode parasite, Dyrophilaria imitis, or the blood and heart, has been known for several centuries, as has been known the important transmission mechanism of the disease by the mosquito for about a century. However, it is only in the last 20 years, due to the rapid diffusion of filariasis in dogs kept for company and work dogs, that research institutes, pharmaceutical companies and vets have paid increasing attention to the problem. It is therefore important that dog owners are also aware, even if in general terms, of the existence and phenomena of the parasitosis. The transmission of the disease occurs through the mosquito's sting, which takes up the filaria larvae by sucking blood from an infected subject to then inoculate them into another healthy dog. The high contagiousness of the parasitosis is therefore easily understandable, in addition to its seasonality, spring-summer. During a period of around six months, the larvae in the dog's blood grow into adult worms that are situated in the heart and pulmonary arteries. In turn, the adult filariae produce small larvae called microfilariae, which will live in the blood. The dogs most affected are obviously those that spend more or less long periods outside, hence gun dogs, work dogs, and those that sleep in the open. The damage induced by the presence of the filariae is of considerable seriousness for that which concerns the cardiocirculatory function and initially shown as a tendency for dogs to tire easily and the presence of a cough or respiratory dysfunction. The vet giving treatment at this stage will perform different clinical and laboratory tests that will confirm the presence of the parasites. On the contrary, the damage caused by chronic cardiopulmonary filariasis is extremely serious. The alteration of the cardiocirculatory function is often accompanied by liver and kidney lesions and a state of generalized hypersensitivity in the whole organism. The prevention programs that have only been practicable for a few years thanks to the use of specific new drugs are simple to carry out and do not involve toxicity risks for dogs. After having carried out a test to ensure the absence of a previous infestation, the oral administration of a medicine once a month for the duration of the entire hot season will give dogs effective protection also if they are stung by an infected mosquito.